In 2011, following the release of a landmark report on the forgotten connections between Harvard University and slavery, President Drew Faust said, Harvard must do its part to undermine the legacies of race and slavery that continue to divide our nation. One of the most tangible of those legacies is mass incarceration. The Harvard Prison Education Project is an effort to grapple with this history. Harvard University's relationship to prisons dates back to 1833, when the Divinity School began sending tutors into local prisons. Members of the Harvard community have worked to improve and transform the conditions in the Massachusetts prison system for nearly two centuries. Most notably, in the 1920s, Harvard College alumni Howard Belding Gill developed the community prison, an approach to incarceration that didn't involve exploitative labor, striped uniforms, or solitary confinement. Gill realized his vision at the Norfolk Prison Colony, which he arranged like a college campus. Prisoners participated in cooperative self-government with staff. They ran a radio show, a newspaper, and a jazz orchestra and they had access to an extensive library. Yet of all the programs made available to prisoners at Norfolk, the debate team, which at one time included Malcolm X, was its most successful. By 1952, Harvard had participated in eight debates against the Norfolk team. Debate was just one way Harvard interacted with the prison. Beginning in 1934, a Harvard law professor helped create a student assistantship program in which graduate students spent a summer living, teaching, and learning at Norfolk. Renowned Harvard professors such as Gordon Alport and Richard Cabot also brought classes to the prison on a regular basis through the 1950s. Meanwhile, Harvard's Phillips Brooks House Association began offering classes at Norfolk and at the Framingham Reformatory for Women and has maintained a presence at both prisons ever since. Hundreds of students at both institutions have received instruction from PBHA tutors on subjects ranging from leathercraft to philosophy to comparative theology. These important efforts of alumni, faculty, and PBHA stand alongside the university's harmful relationship to incarcerated people. Harvard's entanglement with slavery is again mirrored in the exploitation of prisoners. During World War II, as scientists sought medical innovations for the American military, professors at the Harvard Medical School injected cattle blood into Norfolk prisoners as a potential substitute for human blood plasma. The so-called Norfolk guinea pig experiment ended when these injections killed two people. In the early 1960s, Harvard professor Timothy Leary led the Concord Prison Experiment, which administered LSD to prisoners and college students. And in response to urban unrest later that decade, Harvard Medical School professors Vernon Mark, William Sweet, and Frank Irvin received multi-million dollar grants from the Department of Justice and other federal agencies to research genetic connections between violence, criminality, and the brain. Their study, which has been discredited by scholars, subjected poor and incarcerated people to various forms of medical experimentation and surgery. At a moment when Harvard researchers sought biological explanations for rebellion, the Attica uprising brought national attention to American prisons and demands for improved conditions and educational opportunities. The people in here are treated like dogs, and we're going to get what we demand, or we're going to die trying. They have a list of uh, what they call practical demands. Just about every one of them have to do with the improvement of prison conditions. If we cannot live as people, then we will at least try to die like men. <laughs> In 1972, one year after Attica, incarcerated people were able to use federal Pell Grant funding for the first time. Many universities responded to the call for educational programming, including Boston University, which founded one of the longest running prison education programs in the country. 
Incarcerated people in Massachusetts and elsewhere met a devastating setback two decades later when Congress passed the 1994 Crime Bill. We will have the means by which we can say punishment will be more certain. There must be no doubt about whose side we're on. People who commit crimes should be caught, convicted, and punished. The legislation ended Pell Grant funding for people with convictions, decimating college and prison initiatives in the process. Privately funded prison education programs have attempted to fill the void created by the 1994 Act, and President Barack Obama launched the Second Chance Pell Grant Program for Prisoners in 2015. Yet the problems stemming from mass incarceration remain as urgent as ever. Rigorous research has demonstrated a relationship between undereducation and incarceration. 68% of those incarcerated in state prisons have not received a high school diploma. Universities are uniquely positioned to provide opportunities to communities that have been systematically denied access to education. Harvard's educational offerings inside prisons have been largely limited to student tutoring from 1833 until 2008, when professors Bruce Western and Kaya Stern launched the Prison Studies Project. Western and Stern taught a sociology class at Norfolk, which brought 20 college students from Harvard's main campus to Norfolk Prison so that students could learn together. On a bare-bones budget, Stern went on to teach five more such classes, three at Norfolk and two at Framingham, before funding ran out. The university should be an antidote in many ways uh, uh, to mass incarceration. In my estimation, education is a basic human right, and people in jails and prisons across our country have been systematically denied access to what already belongs to them by virtue of their being human. Um, so to bring students who have this unbelievable opportunity and students who've been denied opportunity together is um, to be in community in a different way. And this means uh, teaching uh, in prison, uh, uh, inviting people uh, who have come into conflict with the law and been involved in the justice system uh, into the educational opportunities that uh, the university uh, provides. It means uh, doing research uh, on the problems and social costs uh, of incarceration and, uh, and punitive criminal justice policy. Uh, it means providing a forum uh, for uh, the voices of people who have been made invisible. And it's a deeply humanizing thing, I think, in the context of uh, a prison environment to be using your mind in a, a creative and unfettered way. I want to be part of it because I always wanted to go to college, but in my life it just wasn't a possibility. During those first few months of my incarceration it was a really, a really rough time. Like I didn't have very much hope for my life. I felt like I'd really screwed it up and I, I didn't know you know, how I was going to fix it. <clears throat> when I found out that there were college classes, it gave me some hope. Making sure that I finished my degree, made that promise to my children, made that promise to my mom. So that was something where it was meaningful, so it gave me a chance to fulfill that part of the promise. Part of my application to the class was that I disclosed to Kaya <clears throat> that I had been in prison before because I had a cousin who had been incarcerated. As students coming from outside, maybe students that have never stepped foot in a prison, uh, this is a way of making ourselves uncomfortable and of getting out of this bubble and of going into the real world, right? Not just uh, in theorizing our, about it right. and talking <clears throat> about these like systems and trends and policies, just as abstracts, but actually being there in person and realizing like the magnitude of the system. The experience of the BU Harvard class for me, um, it, was, it was kind of shocking because when I walked in, 
they seen um, the students. You know, I'm looking at them, they're looking at us, and it was, you know, it's all. <laughs> the first day, I think we were all a little apprehensive and nervous because we didn't know how the students and the professor were going to react to the fact that we were prisoners. And to me, Harvard was Ivy League school. You know, you're thinking, okay, you're going to have these preppy rich kids or something. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. Or how can they relate to what I've been through, to urban sociology class? How are they going to relate to that? I remember Kaya said on both sides, you know, people should share what they're comfortable with. They should share whatever parts of their background, so whether it was a student who had formerly been a prosecutor um, or someone who was caught for um, a crime that they committed and ended up incarcerated. When their backgrounds were relevant, it came up in the discussion, but it was not the centerpiece of the class. When we were in the class, it felt like the whole prison world disappeared. I was just a student in a classroom. We read that book, The History of Crime and Punishment, and we read another book about the spirit of punishment. So I was learning, Kaya was teaching us about why, why prisons are in existence and, and why there's this atmosphere of punishment there, especially with women. It sounds like it's different for men. The way men are punished is different than the way women are punished, you know? So I certainly had a sense of all of those things before meeting Kaya, but I didn't have words to name those experiences. I'm very opinionated, but I'm not very educated, you know, and didn't have any facts to back up my opinions, you know, and I couldn't make any legitimate arguments with somebody about anything because I didn't know anything about the world, the world that I wanted to change because I didn't like how the world was, but how do you change it if you don't know anything about it? It was toward the end of the class that Kaya invited one of the students who was incarcerated to share a piece of writing about her experience in solitary confinement. And it was the most difficult thing that I've ever heard and probably ever will hear. And it was a moment of realizing that Too many courses, too many conversations talk about issues of incarceration in the abstract, and this brought it home. It was someone I had become close to through the class and really cared about, and listening to her experience being mentally broken down was so challenging and, and heartbreaking. And that is one moment that will always stick with me. And it's a moment that stuck with me as I went through law school, thinking, why am I doing this? Um, it was that voice, that injustice that really stayed with me. In the communities that I work with, you know, uh, especially with Latino undocumented communities, you know, we know about racism from experience, but we don't really know about racism as a systematic uh, thing, right? And so uh, with this, of course, comes incarceration and, and prison, as I learned in this class. Um, and so that's a big part of how, how I was influenced in, and, and how I still bring this class with me uh, in my work today. I mean, in the future, I would love to continue to do some of the work of like training people that have been incarcerated or teaching people that have been incarcerated or are incarcerated. Um, the problem is honestly that there's not enough of these programs, there's not enough funding, and that is a reality of the system and the fact that we really don't invest in, in people that have been incarcerated or are incarcerated. You can only play dominoes and cards for so long, you know, and work out. So this gives me something to do, and it's something positive. You know, it's something I could tell I have a little girl. You know, she's 13 years old now. I can tell her, you know, she asked me, Dad, what are you doing there? I'm like, I'm going to school, I'm taking college courses. The sign I can tell her and, you know, be proud of it. People that are in colleges are there uh, because they have been given an opportunity. And if you gave opportunities to so many other people, they would exceed, you know, expectations. These institutions and universities, or many times become a bubble, right, where you sort of stayed in and and you're protected and you don't go out and you think that everything is the academy or your classes or your grades. 
and there are bigger issues. Students of Harvard are incredibly privileged to go to a beautiful school with exceptional teachers and have these amazing opportunities, which is all wonderful. But I think that students at Harvard should seek out opportunities outside of that bubble. And I think that the university itself has an obligation to make those experiences readily accessible to students, to invite students to go to places that they wouldn't normally go to, learn from people that they may never have been exposed to, and really expand the classroom beyond just the, the walls of Harvard, expand the classroom so that it includes learning from the society that they are trying to fix. There's something wrong with, with the criminal system in the United States. What are we gonna do about it? Hopefully start with learning about it. And the best way that I could see to do that is to go to the source, go to people who have been directly impacted by it. I didn't feel like I was part of the society. I felt I was outside of society, you know, as, as a criminal. You know, I just, I was the other part. I was one of the have-nots, and now I am one of the haves because I have an education, and, and I can lend that to society itself, you know, and make my little difference in the world. Prison education is not about saving public dollars or building a more robust economy filled with marketable employees. It is about remaking our education system, redefining our moral imperatives, and sharpening our notions of justice. President Drew Faust recently championed equal access to education as a civil right. Education, she wrote, liberates the mind even when the body is oppressed. One way to realize this is to expand the rich tradition of Harvard education in Massachusetts prisons by offering accredited classes with Harvard and incarcerated students and to commit to opening the campus to post-incarcerated students and staff. Today, Harvard is falling behind many of our peer institutions. Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Cornell, Georgetown, NYU, and Wesleyan all offer university courses inside of local prisons. As Faust writes, to open the gates is to close the gap. Beyond the gates is a call to realize this vision.